Hello, and welcome back to Channel 4. And we have a really, really exciting session uh, planned today. Um, I'm personally also very excited about it uh, as our as our next speaker has been involved uh, really uh, from the dawn of, uh, of digital government transformation. And so uh, the session today is um, you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube and how the pandemic has permanently changed our approach to public services. And I am super delighted to uh, introduce uh, Liam Maxwell, who uh, was formerly uh, of the uh, CTO of the uh, UK government um, and where uh, a, a friend of mine encouraged me 10 years ago to travel over to London and see what they were doing 10 years ago and uh, had an opportunity to meet Liam then. Since then, he's now moved on to uh, be the Director of Government Transformation at Amazon Web Services. And Liam, welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Very excited to have you. Thanks, Ian. And uh, yes, welcome to uh, just near Oxford. Uh, this, this conference, I imagine, just stretches all the way around the world. And uh, it's, it's great, to, uh, great to be here. That's right. We are a very global conference. Thank you for, for zooming in from the uh, from across the water. And uh, I, I would just want to take a moment to remind the audience that as you as you are uh, going through your uh, your presentation, there's an opportunity for them to add questions into the chat, uh, and that's something which uh, will then uh, find its way to Liam uh, as uh, over the course of the session. Uh, Liam will have an, an opportunity to address those. Uh, questions near the end. I'll remind you that uh, please uh, abide by the code of conduct uh, when you're when you're asking questions. And uh, when uh, when this is all wrapped up, I'll be I'll be back. And uh, but for now, I got to get out of the way. And uh, really excited to have you, Liam. Thank you for being Thanks here. Very, thanks very much, Ian. Um, Denny, can we have the uh, the deck up and display? Thanks very much. Great, good. Um, welcome, everybody. I've got about half an hour, I think, something like that. What I'd like to do is make sure that we can take um, questions and uh, please do um, ask me anything. Ask me if it comes into your mind, please ask me and they'll come through on the chat to me. First time using this, um, this piece of tech. We've all started to use different pieces of conference software, all the rest of it. Got to say signing up to this thing was really smooth. So thank you very much to the team behind all this. I know that when people don't notice what you're doing, it actually makes a great thing. So thank you very much. This was a really smooth um, transition. So I'm going to talk about this subject, hopefully this will pop up, which is you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. Really, this was a, came out of a conversation we were having with um, one of the governments that we work with. And they were, they were essentially saying, yeah, but it's going to be really difficult later. You know, what's going to happen? We're going to go back to the bad old days because everything had been moving fast. Everything had been moving really quickly. And we thought about it and it was rather like when we brought in transparency into the UK government in 2010, 2011 and published um, expenditure uh, over 500 pounds and then started to publish data around what was going on in government and then started to do more and more transparency around contracts so that we could start to drive procurement. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But that ended up with um, projects that were really challenging. One of my colleagues, Caroline Mulligan, was working on um, the racial disparity audit, uh, a piece of transparency that managed to expose the issues um, of, of racial disparity in all walks of British life. It's really important that we made that substance, but that was made that a substantial piece of policy work. But the great thing about that was that's going to keep on going because once you start doing these things, you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. It's there. People are going to start using it. So the great thing about the reforms I'm going to talk about today or it's my very firm belief that this is just part of the journey. We've just gone a lot faster, a lot quicker. So look, a little bit of background. Um, I work for AWS. AWS is part of Amazon. It's the IT company underneath Amazon. It supplies loads of other companies as well. And it really was born out of the way that Amazon was doing its computing and decided it wanted to be able to build services that worked for itself. And then started to realize that it was able to start to industrialize the or do the undifferentiated heavy lifting for other organizations and in so doing started to create a company that was built on the same basis as amazon working backwards from the customer 
And that meant that we could start to build services that our customers like and our customers need. And that's how the company has been born. Um, it's tremendously fast moving. I, the, uh, the company's growing at an amazing clip. But one of the great things about it is the innovation. And having moved from the civil service, the amount of innovation and change that happens every day is enormous. And it's one of the things that I find most challenging is just to keep up with all of the services that are being created. Now, I was the CTO for the uh, British government and I was there at the time of great change. I led a team that delivered a lot of change through that program. And I was also really privileged to be able to start working with some of the, the really top digital leaders inside the UK and then worldwide. And so having started working with people who I'm sure you're all familiar with, like Tom Lusmore and James Duncan and um, um, uh, Andy Beale were really core cool, um, colleagues. We then started to build um, an approach to technology, an approach to digital transformation that other people started to look at and other people started to want to work with us on. What we were doing wasn't right, but some of it worked. And the bits that worked, we liked sharing with other people. And so as we grew that team, we were also growing um, a group of international governments who wanted to work in a similar way. And we'll talk a little bit about, I'm doing a talk later about digital nations and how that grew out of this approach. But as I did that, it became really clear that I could either continue to do that for the British government, or I could try and do it faster. I could help set up a team that could help governments start to move faster. And that's what I do at Amazon. I'm really lucky, I've got a great team. And what we do is we go and work with governments to help them accelerate their digital transformation programs, help them accelerate their modernization. And I was looking back on the um, slides recently of Forward 50 thinking, how do I do this and, and, and get away with having an okay presentation? And I saw my colleague, Maria Ines Back, who now works with me um, in, in, in my team to deliver change. And it's fantastic to have people of Maria Ines's caliber working to help governments. So that's, that's genuinely what we do. We help governments with the transformation programs, with the advice and the support to get that moving. And the, and the dynamics we have are a lot more effective now that a lot of the, the, uh, the changes that started us off got us moving. And I'll just go back to what made change happen in those days. Well, open standards. Some of you may remember, we had a very interesting run in in the UK government over open standards and making sure that we had a definition of open standards that could promote open source. And open source was right at the heart of the reforms that we led, but based on that open standards definition right at the beginning. And that took many years to get through, but we got it through and it's now the accepted norm for standards. There's an open standards board and that drives through the change. And we use open standards because we're using the internet. We then pushed very strongly on open source and I'll have some examples of that a bit later on. But open source is really that driving force, that classic accelerant for the government. We talked about transparency and opening data. And so we not only were transparent about the data that people were using, and started to publish large amounts of that data, but we also started to use that data to help change people's minds, to help change people's views of what was going on. And there was a wonderful tool, the performance dashboard, which enabled us to see services running in real time. And this was a really cracking way of helping people identify whether things were working or not, what did work, what could be changed, how you could make things better, not using anecdote, but using data. And then we started to move towards um, using that to, to help us inform senior leaders. And when senior leaders were able to see quite how many people were using their services, it actually started to drive that change. When people were seeing quite how many people were doing, for example, a driving test or a driving license application, the number did elicit the response sometimes of, and how come that contract is 300 million pounds a year? It started that debate and got us moving because the thing we were trying to do was reform. And so using data to drive reform was one of the core vectors that we used at that point. And then open markets, we'll talk a little bit later about how if you start to use open markets, you can start to generate innovation and that then starts to drive your reforms faster. Remember the whole point here is to generate momentum so that you can get your reforms moving quickly. So 
one large point that I learned very early on when I was working in government is don't do it all yourself. You can't. It's a team effort. It's a team sport. All of the services as you build new services, yes, they need a service manager, but you also need a huge multidisciplinary team to work with you to make that work. I'm sorry, not huge, but a really talented multidisciplinary team to make that work. And that's one of the things that I'm trying to push forward now is try and think about the fact that you need to work with teams together in order to get your agenda forward and in order to get the momentum you need to make the changes stick in your organization. So let's have a think. What just happened? What happened in the last nine months is that the world turned on its axis, really. And we started to move away from things which were um, designed and delivered and, 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 and everything which was very deliberate and took a long time to get moving. And we started to move to things where government started to move really, really fast. And so that was a massive change. The role of government has changed within our lives. The role of health has changed within our lives. No longer will we be thinking about just having identity. We are going to find that identity and health are linked together, whether we like it or not. So what we need to do is understand the situation. And that's where um, using data and being open about data is really important. Some of my colleagues, um, I've got a great privilege to work alongside, created the Register of Open Data. And I just thought it'd be good just to show you the data analysis of uh, which is available. Um, this was one of the shots we took quite early on in the uh, program, which is the, uh, the, the COVID-19 data lake. And this was a way of trying to work out what was happening, what was the trend, where was the trend happening? And these, these graphics, as you can see, and the, this data representation, very high level very much just tracking what on earth is going on. And if you think back to what we knew at that point, this was, this was where we were. We really didn't know that much about what was going on and people were just tracing that things were happening. And yet, if we then move to down the line, let's have a look at what we're looking at now on that same model, that same model of open data using uh, data, like collecting data from all the way around the world, making sure it comes into, um, in, in, into a common place. And then the analysis on that, that's filling up things where you can start to ask really interesting questions. And those interesting questions are there to help drive reform. So question here, you've got the total cases, COVID, very high in Israel, and yet the deaths per million, much higher in the United Kingdom than in Israel. And yet the number of cases is different. So you can start there to plot together the causality behind that. Um, and start to try and identify issues of where things will change or where things are going to be different. And then also try and track things. I was uh, tracking um, a number of, uh, there you go, there's a set of American states we were looking at a couple of days ago. Um, no surprise why we were looking then, but you can see there that the changes and the, the acceleration of, um, of cases is something uh, that's quite, quite easy to spot now because we're able to track that data. Now, I know everyone's been looking at data, everyone's been looking at election maps all day today, trying to work out you know, what's going to happen to the last 60,000 votes in Wisconsin and all of that stuff. But the big thing here is go back a year and people were shouting about the need to, for data to be able to inform policy and policy to be able to change itself with data. We would bemoan the fact that governments ran using anecdote to try and deliver change, that we would use anecdote to try and make things, um, um, make our case better. And I do remember, I mean, lots of people, um, you know, would find that the guy with the, or the guy, or the, the person with the best story would win the argument. And yet now, more and more, the argument about what you're going to do is based on data. I mean, it's a grisly starting point to make sure that we get through that. It's a really difficult and challenging situation. But perhaps if we've learned one thing in the last nine months, it's that by analyzing and using data to help you make decisions, you will be in a better position to make the right decision. Doesn't mean you're going to make the right decision. It just means you're going to be in a better position to do that. And if you continue to start to make better quality of decision, you're going to be in a position where you're going to be much better at offering the services people need with their governments, which means that government's transformation is going to start to become effective because we're no longer going to be allocating resources on the basis of anecdote. We're going to be allocating resources on the basis 
of need. And we go back to that point, don't we, that what is the user need is a really fundamental question to ask when you're delivering services. Now, I'll make no apology for the fact that I think one of the most fundamental approaches to making decisions and changing things is Wardley mapping. I was going to put on a, my usual standard picture of Simon, but I thought I'd spare you all of that. But Simon Wardley introduced a, a technique which is now growing massive currency around the world, which is Wardley mapping, which helps you identify in the value chain how a process works, how a business runs, using the business components, not just the tech, the business components that enable you to construct a function. And that really helps us gain situational awareness about what's going on and which components in our services are using those things. It also enables us to see which components in our services need to go at a different rate of evolution, or in some cases, revolution as they go through this. And so a Wardley map enables us to identify what's going on. My, my COD Wardley map there on the right-hand side is of course the one where you think, and this is a long argument, where what do you do that's agile? And what do you do that's Six Sigma? Well, that's the rough split on a Wardley map for that. I know it's rough. It's rough, I know, but it enables us to see what's going on there. So um, let's then have a look at what's changed. So I'm gonna give a couple of examples now about what's changed and what the four things were that we saw change and move really fast. Number one was speed. I think I've alluded to this before, but governments needed to work really, really fast. And so they needed to be able to react quickly and also help people move really quickly. Um, good example of that, um, we saw in the United Kingdom uh, wanted to get a note out and set up a service for one and a half million people who were vulnerable and needed to stay at home in the first lockdown and be and, and have supplies delivered, etc. That was uh, a really um, challenging ask, actually, because the, the minister responsible wanted to set that up now. And it was one of those cases where we were trying to do things, everyone was trying to do things really, really quickly. Um, there's an automated service reached 1.5 million people on the, of the UK's most vulnerable people um, and, and enabled them to uh, register for supplies and help setting, set things up. That was set up in 48 hours. Minister came on a Thursday afternoon and said, I want to do this. He was able to announce it on the Sunday talk shows. That's really fast in government terms to build something of that scale. So it was really, really important to be able to do that quickly. And it was also really important that we were able to do that safely, securely. But the other side of this as well, I just wanted to raise is that the change we also noticed was not just that things needed to work at speed. It was also that things needed to work at a different scale. Now, I've always said that one of the great things about working in the public sector is that you're able to work at a much greater scale. And the reason is frankly, because government is for everybody. There's no market segmentation. Government is for all of the people. It's funded by all of the people. It's delivered for all of the people. Part of what we define the work we do is helping governments realize the fundamental right of a citizen to enjoy the benefits and the services due to them by the government to which they've paid taxation. That's what we try to do. And so the scale of the issues and the scale of the reach we have to work out is of a different order to anything else in the private sector. And that's why governments can really take, you know, it's so admirable the way they work at scale because they're able to do things at such enormous scale so quickly again. And that's the other point here. It is working quickly. And so just a couple of things I remember working on early days in this and, and seeing come past. There was um, CIMAC Online in Indonesia managed to reach out and do um, uh, um, distance education. So two and, a half, two and a half million exams, 600,000 exam questions put together really, really quickly. Um, similar to a company um, um, uh, that we saw working in Bangalore doing very, very similar um, application. Um, in Chile, we saw um, the Universidad de los Lagos move to put 11, all 11,000 students online pretty much in a week. The Portuguese government moved everybody online in a week. The Egyptian government moved everybody, uh, all of the training for and education for K through 12 online pretty much instantaneously. Amazing examples of leadership at that stage. But the scale is enormous. And so people need to be able to get going at scale. Um, and that was one of the things which really resonated, speed and scale. But then people have got to trust what you're telling them. So a couple of words about trust. 
it's really important that the um, that the people trust the sources of the data that they're getting. That's why um, when we looked at Cambridge, when they were looking at the Cambridge University's trust, uh, healthcare trust, helping them train people to use uh, PPE, had to get that right first time. Had to put, have people trust that. Um, BPA France in um, France, the uh, the independent bank that was providing advice to um, small businesses, that advice had to be right. It had to change as well and be right. And so you had to start building up the security and trust of your users by being clear and open about the transmission of information. Now, not every government has done that well. Not every public service has done that well. It's been a massive learning game. It's been a massive period of learning and trying to explain and trying to be really, I think what people come back to and say is, you know, just be straight with me. And so being able to have services that can change and change what they're saying and change the way they're saying it is really important. And that's why having being able to build things and design things to work in a way that can change on the fly has been one of the things that governments have started to know and appreciate and they've now done it. And if you think about that, it's really difficult at that point to get that toothpaste back in the tube. So we've seen that all the way through, contact tracing apps come, contact tracing apps go, contact tracing, old fashioned contact tracing in the way they've been doing in, um, in the state of Maryland, which has been copied widely across the US. That's another way of using data, but trusted data from a trusted source, which means that they're able to continue to have a consistent and consolidated service. And then also making sure that there's the security in place that you can work in a different way. Um, Cagliari in Italy had to move everybody on their antiquated IT systems. They have to move out. Everyone's working from home. We saw this all the way around the public services. People are starting to work from home, especially in local authorities or regional authorities. Some of the tech there was really challenging to work remotely. And that's where things like workspaces help people try and, 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 and tap into that information and tap into the desktop in a secure way so that they could work effectively as they were in the office but from home. And the flexibility shown there was enormous. And what that led to was the ability for public services to start to become more resilient. That we noticed that if we started to push the envelope here, you could start to become much more resilient about the way that you worked and much more resilient about the systems that you put together, that they would stand up. And it also, and this is the point I found really exciting, led to a lot more collaboration that people were starting to work together really effectively. Didn't matter which country they were in, we're all facing the same crisis. This led to a much more accentuated version of collaboration. And I talked a bit earlier about how it was a great privilege to start working with governments and helping them work together. The collaboration was really, really important because governments don't compete. I mean, why should governments compete? The Swedes are going to set up a, never going to set up a driving license service in Germany. They're never going to do that. Governments don't compete for these resources so they can share. And you can share not just the resources, but also the things that you have designed and developed. This was one of the uh, architectural slides as we developed this policy in the UK that we put together was that if you're able to run off a common infrastructure and also if you're able to use registers, and I know that that is not an easy ask. You can actually start to share some of the open source, some of the components that you put together your services with can be shared. Because you don't compete with anybody else, so you can share those components with others and they will get better. That approach of having open source components in governments means that more and more of the undifferentiated heavy lifting of building a service can be shared with others. And in fact, that means that you designing and delivering and putting the services together in the digital service teams have far less complexity to deal with in the, um, in, the, in, the, in the structural knitting of the applications that you put together in the technology and can really start to focus on the things that we all know are so important in the design and development of really excellent services, which is user research and proper design and continuous iterative development. So using a common platform, using registers, I know registers, difficult ask, and open source components means that you're able to start to develop services using multidisciplinary teams in a much more effective and a faster way. It accelerates transformation. And that's why one of the things that we've tried to push and, and, and really started to work with governments on now, and, and one of my 
Um, my, my first AWS service, uh, actually, it may as well brag at least about one thing, which is this, open government solutions, which is where we try to put links to the services that we've seen around the world that work really effectively in governments, the open source components that work really well across governments. And some of those things are actually just the ways of introducing reform, a, a technology code of practice or a digital service standard or, um, or, or, or a cloud first policy or, 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 or those things which we've seen work and we've seen work really well in governments, we've curated those into a library where we can point people towards where those assets are. We also have a digital delivery. We've got some design patterns in there, uh, building uh, and, and, and looking at a, a whole catalog of prototype, tips, um, prototype kits. And, and then also, yes, we'll point out the code so that it's easy for someone who's trying to get moving. It's easy for someone who's trying to accelerate their government reforms. If you need to find something that someone's already built or put together, it should be in this box. This is the government in a box that I think I bored most of my colleagues around when I was um, working in government. That if you could put it all in one place at the, where you can point to it, obviously the assets don't sit in here, we point to the assets of where they are, it enables governments to work much more quickly and enables public servants to start to work together themselves. And we have in there a whole set of uh, emergency responses, uh, open source emergency responses to COVID-19, which also put in that place. Now. This isn't the whole answer. This is a help. This is here to try and help people make those next steps and use it as a way of identifying and curating what other people have been doing so that you can collaborate and you can know who to go and collaborate with. So I do encourage you to go and have a look at that. It's, it's, um, it's been um, a, a great privilege to, to, to put that together and worked with a great team to actually go and research around the world. I have to say um, that the one thing which really stuck out, I was asked in an interview yesterday, well, you know, the big surprise, I suppose my real big surprise was that um, there's a UK service in there called Notify, which we point to. It points off to where that, that service sits. And um, Notify was the most amazing success. I'm sure people have talked about it at this conference. I'm sure they talked about it at the last conference. Really the brainchild of um, a fantastic Kiwi, Pete Hurley, he, who's been pushing it really, really hard. And the great thing about Notify is that that noti enables you to notify citizens about things going on. Very important to do at the moment, as you know. But Canada's got one. Australia's got one. They all look fairly similar. Well, you know why that is, don't you? It's really important that if governments can collaborate, that you can share it and you can start to develop common patterns and common approaches, which means that governments can all work together more effectively, collaborate more effectively, and then the development of services becomes much quicker. The modernization that we drive becomes quicker. Also, one of the things we've seen, particularly through the crisis, has been the ability for people suddenly to discover that procurement could actually work quite quickly. Well, let's go back over that. Why, why did procurement always work slowly? Well, one of the reasons procurements have worked slowly is because in many cases we go out and try and procure and governments go out and try and procure services in big silos and the issue with that is that that automatically precludes innovation because you're sort of buying an outsource and it does mean that you're not really able to access people who can do particular point solutions in an effective and efficient way and so one of the things that that really starts to drive is that drives a lack of innovation, a lack of ability to change, and also a greater investment in the risk with your supplier. Because if you're only using one supplier to do a big thing, that then means that your risk with them is really difficult. I do remember talking to a supplier once who delivered an entire service and turned around and said, well, actually, do you know what? You could, uh, you could pay our new price or we could stop the service. Now, that is not the position you want to be in. That was a position we inherited at that point. And that led us to have a much more risk-friendly approach, a much more risk-averse approach to procurement and to sourcing, which is the approach you've got on the right there, which is where you start to buy. Some of your components can be in a platform basis. Some of your components can be shared across different services, and some of them could be small specialist services which work together. Procuring in that way, is the way that people have really started to procure as we've seen it through this pandemic.
And again, this is something which they won't put the toothpaste back in the tube. You can't go back over it. And what happens? Well, it's actually pretty good for your economy if you do that as well. And if we think about what does change at that point, this is the change of the supply chain we had in the UK between 2010 and 2015, the direct supply chain. Really small number of government um, supplies all going through a small group of large companies, big word beginning with O to describe that one. I used to get banned from using, but it used to be a bit of an oligopoly there. And now look at it, even five years ago, huge number of um, uh, supply chains, small businesses working with government, just over, just under half of all the supplies in that service and uh, in that particular framework now are delivered by small, medium enterprises, which means jobs, which means skills, which means skills dispersed all the way around the country so that people could start to build the services that government wanted to use. That approach to procurement, we are seeing now the same patterns happening in countries around the world as they're trying to get the innovation they need in order to deliver um, in the pandemic. So that again is one of those reforms which is happening. And so what we're building here and we're seeing being built here is that approach to using common platforms, common approaches where you can leverage the common approaches, leverage the common shared infrastructure, leverage as much as you can. And then that allows you to focus on building services that really meet your users needs. And that design pattern, the fundamental design pattern that the Wardley map gives you where you leverage the common resources and focus on what you can change. That's right at the heart of all of the really successful transformations we've seen. And the people that were able to go fastest and the people that were able to reform most and the people that were able to grow with scale and the people that were able to build a responsive government as they went through um, uh, the, the crisis were those that had worked out how to leverage, how to focus on things and how to leverage things. And so that's really where I wanted to get to with this talk. Relatively short, relatively quick, but a way of explaining how far and what we've seen as the trends and the opportunities that we've seen around the world of those governments that have become responsive. And it's really about being able to separate those two main components, buy in the way that separates those two main components, design in the way that separates those two main components so that you can actually run faster, grow bigger, be more secure, and then also be responsive as a government. So I've seen there's quite a few questions in there. That's it for me, and I should come back to Ian, and we could possibly talk about the questions. Hey, Liam, thank you. And yes, there are a bunch of really interesting questions. Um, so maybe let's just start taking these questions from the audience. I think the first one was really about how can one have a strategy to address the uh, modernization of the tech stack uh, given that government has such a wide uh, yeah. um, okay. history. So there's, I'm not going to give you a short answer on that one. So um, the legacy problem is one of those things that really, really holds people back. And uh, we spent quite a long time. And actually, Ian, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about James Duncan here because he was the genius that I worked with on this one where we really worked through how do you resolve the legacy issue? And there are many ways of doing it um, that all seem to want to be massively systemic. I remember James coming up with a, with a slide which showed a volcano near Iceland erupting in the sea. Uh, and he turned around to the minister at the time and went, yes, this is what it looks like to boil the ocean. Okay. We're not going to do that. We're going to have a different approach. And it was born of the fact that we had recruited a whole load of really, really talented CIOs and CTOs to come and work in government. And they had spent come in with all the best intentions, but then had found that they were working night and day, dealing with some procurement contract that was imperfect, and they were being challenged to go and reduce the spend by 20% and then come back and do the digital reform. But it was the digital reform we'd hired them for. And we burned through several really, really talented CTOs by doing that. And one of the things we worked out was let's stop that. Stop that procurement. Go and take all of that legacy and go and stick that in a, in, and, and, you know, we had the idea. It was stick it in a hotel, California. Go and stick it somewhere where it can check in, looked after, everything's happy with it, but it can never leave. And that behavioral change that that brought about was absolutely 
I mean, it was, it was it was the whole approach to legacy changed at that point because no longer were departments focusing on legacy as the thing they had to do the legacy and that just took the legacy away as an issue in terms of the future development because everything else you would then develop from that point would be done in the new way in a proper way and so that approach though we formed a JV limited company called the Crown Hosting Service. It, it, and it, it, it saved billion, you know, a very, very large amount of money. But the main reason it worked was because it forced departments to say, actually, is that legacy or is that not? If it's legacy, it goes in there. And there's one department, I won't name them, they, they were absolutely determined. They said that we we're never going to use that service you've built. We're never going to use it because we will reform rather than face the embarrassment of seeing our stuff become legacy. And that was great because that meant it worked. Mm -hmm. We were able to change the behavior in that long term of moving legacy into legacy. It does also mean, just, just do bear in mind that fundamental design choice as well, is as you go and build your next set of systems and everyone thinks I'm gonna go and do it um, and, and I'll do it right this time. And instead of, you know, there are 25 systems doing the same thing, I'll build one, one of these to do it all. There's a really great opportunity for you. If you've got 25 systems and you build one, to, to, you know, to be the system that does it all is that what you'll end up with is 26 legacy systems. <laughs> so so right. you've, got be, you've got to be really clear that that is the change that you want to bring. And the great thing about the way we, we, we managed to get that going through Crown Hosting was uh, on the board, I mean, look, I'm a difficult person. I sat on the board of that company and nothing was allowed to leave it. Um, and, uh, that, was, that was the important thing the, 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 you know, it was where glorious, wonderful heritage computing i think i heard tom lewis more call that once heritage <laughs> went to die uh, that was our approach it's not the whole approach to legacy but that would be the that would be the thing i would use as a peg to uh, to get it to move because then you're thinking about organization and you're not thinking about oh goodness is this thing gonna you know topple over and can i keep my data center running sadly we only have two minutes left someone oh, however sorry. has asked uh why did you leave public service um, I tried to explain that at the beginning. Um, I, I, had a, I had a choice. I, I could have, one of the things we were going to do was um, create a consultancy style thing which would help other governments because it was very difficult in government. We were helping um, governments around the world uh, to make change happen. And I, um, I had a choice and it's very personal. I'm not going to be too um, corporate about it at all. I had a choice. I could, we could either go and do that or I could go and work with some of the brightest people I knew. So I went and worked with a bunch of the brightest people I knew who wanted to work at really, really fast pace. And I've, I, I, I often think, you know, should I have stayed? Should I have stayed in and done stuff? And I'll be really honest, I've, I've never worked so fast in my life and it's great. But it's, that's, I, I think in that sense, I made that decision. So there was a question, was it about the agility? I think agility is a, 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 a bit more sort of um, nuanced than, than I'm, I am. I mean, it was about speed. Um, it's that um, Top Gun phrase, isn't it? You know, I felt the need for speed, and uh, that's what that's why I, that's why I moved. Um, yeah, that that I mean that makes sense. Uh, speed, and sometimes folks talk about velocity and how that's a combination of speed and direction, and and uh, we hear that a lot these days. Is that uh, that's an important way to iterate? Uh, and maybe just to tie it to Simon Wardley, thank you for mentioning Simon Wardley. Wardley, I'm a big fan. I'm hoping more and more folks are, are hearing about, uh, about Simon uh, doing some amazing work. Um, Liam, I wanted to, we're going to wrap it up a little bit early. Um, uh, I wanted to, first of all, thank you very much for, uh, for, for, for your session today. I think hearing from someone who's been such a, an early innovator and leader in this space uh, is, is really valuable. And um, you know, thank you for con continuing to lead in the space in your new role. Um, and it was really amazing to hear from you today and to hear about our mutual friend, James Duncan, who, uh, for the purpose of the audience is actually a, 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 a British Canadian. And that's yeah. really why we know each other. Uh, and, and those connections that I think forward 50 is really designed to try to, uh, try to uh, foster and bring together, uh, you know, James is the reason we know each other. And, uh, if that's what it takes, great. Yeah. Um, so thank you, Liam, really, really thank appreciate you your, your presentation. Thank you so today. Much.